and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is dedicated to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Romul Gassain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood. Thank you for coming on the show, and uh, we hope to uh, make use of some of your expertise in some of the subjects that we're talking about. Thank you, Romul. Now, to our viewers, uh, Dr. Mark is from Creation Ministries International, and so we've invited him here to come and to answer some of the common misconceptions which are held about Christianity. Now, Doctor, I've got a, a number of questions here for you. Some of the common arguments that are used against the things that you and I believe. One of the first things is to do with uh, textual inconsistencies. So what I mean by that are some of the contradictions that we find in the Bible. Does that disprove the text? Well, it's interesting that you, you raise this point because a lot of people believe that there are contradictions in the Bible mm -hmm. and that because of that, it's not a trustworthy book. And they raise all kinds of objections and um, indicate different things that they believe are contradictions. But if it is indeed God's word, then we should approach it as being inspired by God. And the correct God-honoring approach would be to seek out to understand what the reason is for these apparent inconsistencies. And we find time and time again that there are quite clear and straightforward answers for them. We find it's a little bit difficult, but I mean, when you read the uh, four gospel accounts, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you find that there are differences there, you know, between the stories. Yes, there are. But think of it this way. If you had witnessed a particular event like a motor vehicle accident and uh, someone else had also witnessed it and you each gave your report to the police, mm -hmm. you would not have identical accounts because you've seen things from your perspective and the other witness would have seen it from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was reminded just recently there was an incident in the newspapers about an aircraft that had an engine that exploded. That's and right, One yes. of the people uh, interviewed afterwards said there was a loud explosion and somebody else said there were two explosions. Uh, one not so big and then a much larger one. So someone was lying, obviously, there. Well, well, you see, if you argued that because the witnesses' accounts were different, uh -huh. therefore there was no such thing as an explosion on this aircraft, uh -huh. then that would be silly, wouldn't it? Yes. Because what it really says is that different people have different perspectives and that actually authenticates the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. And the same is true with the gospel accounts. Different people have different perspectives, but interestingly, not one of those differences affects any matter of doctrine or teaching behind what the Bible is, uh, is sharing, imparting to us. Uh -huh. So really the inconsistencies or what we allege to be inconsistencies are purposely put there for the message or the purpose? Is that what you mean? Or well, I'm not sure. I, th I suppose not so much purposely put there, but yeah. they reflect the reality of okay. that person's eyewitness account. Think of it this way. If all of the, the different accounts of, say, the resurrection of Jesus were all identical, mm -hmm. wouldn't that make you suspicious that they'd all got together and agreed what the text should be? That's you see, right. that would tend to invalidate what the Bible says. Uh -huh. But because there are differences in the eyewitness accounts, that in fact shows us that they are indeed genuine accounts. Uh -huh. Okay, that's, that's one common argument. What about another one which clearly shows that the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament, uh, is a lot different than the God of the New Testament. For example, the God of the Old Testament seems to be a little bit less tolerant, a little bit more wrathful, a little bit more angry. And he you know, asks you know, his so-called chosen people to go out and, and destroy other cultures. Whereas when we read you know, in the New Testament of Jesus, who was God you know, uh, incarnate, he is completely different. You know, he's more yes. loving and merciful and you know, about you know, if someone hits you, you know, just take it on the cheek and so on and so on. Are they two different gods which wrote, wrote the Bible or, you know, uh, yes, uh, what, do you, what sort of conclusions do you come to? That's right. It, it's a very good question. In fact, it's a point that's picked up by Richard Dawkins, who's a very vocal anti-Christian. And uh, in his book, The God Del Delusion, he wrote this. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Mm 
<laughs> he then goes on and makes some rather outlandish statements. But, and his point is exactly what you've just said. If the Bible is written by God and if there is only one God, then how can there be such a difference? But we have to think about the context of those events. You see, when we read the Old Testament, we are reading God revealing himself to mankind as, uh, as a judge, as the creator, as the ruler of the universe. This is before he comes in human form as Jesus, mm -hmm. as our redeemer and our saviour. Mm. Still the same God, he still has the same characteristics, but in the New Testament we see more of his grace and mercy. In the Old Testament we see some of his, his judgment and uh, his sovereignty as God. So. Bear in mind though, when the children of Israel were coming to the promised land, he gave the people in those lands 40 years of warning of what was coming. Really? It wasn't as though someone just knocked on your door and said, okay, Rommel, you have to get out of the house now, I'm moving in because God said I can come. <laughs> it's not like that. You see, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they came with mighty miracles from God the parting of the Red Sea, the people were fed miraculously every single day, their clothes and shoes didn't and wear were, out. They were like heralding, you know, the, the greatness of this God. Absolutely. And the truthfulness of this God can to all imagine, the nations, yeah. Can you imagine the passing travellers who would see these people and, mm. and possibly trade with them and then travel to other countries and they would tell the story of how God's hand was mightily on these people, the God of heaven. So the Canaanites in the Promised Land knew full well they had 40 years of warning. The Bible also says that their sin had reached full measure. These were a very evil people. They engaged in things like child sacrifice, um, in um, incest and, and all kinds of, of uh, grotesque practices that um, are abomination to God. And so Israel, in fact, was um, instructed not to adopt their practices. Mm -hmm. God over and over again said, do not do what the people are doing in the land that you are going to possess. Mm -hmm. So there was ample opportunity. Interestingly too, if you look at the language in the Bible, God speaks of Israel dispossessing the people three times more frequently than he does of them destroying the people. Mm. So moving them out was what his desire was. Now, some of them actually had faith and believed that the God of Israel was the God of heaven and he really was going to do what he'd promised to do. So it wasn't just a case of, you know, if you were a Jew uh, or had Jewish ancestry, that meant that you somehow were in God's favour in terms of, you know, salvation and it doesn't matter what you do, you know, God's always there for you. Is that right? Indeed, other people came. The Bible says that many other people came with the Israelites as they left Egypt. And in particular, I think of Rahab in Jericho. Mm -hmm. Now, she was not a Jew, but she had faith because she knew the God of heaven was with these people. Mm -hmm. So she hid the spies, remember that? And God That's rescued right. her and her whole household. So she had a, a decision to make. And essentially, she chose to take heed to that warning that you were talking about earlier. That's right. Uh -huh. She exercised faith. Mm -hmm. She believed because she saw the evidence that God's hand was on these people mm -hmm. and she believed. Mm -hmm. So God was in fact always merciful towards his people. So we do not have two different gods, a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New. But God is revealing different parts of his character and nature to mankind throughout the whole history of mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, we were talking about this a little bit earlier as we were going through this and we, you, a lot of people tend to shy over the fact that even in the New Testament itself, you know, there's going to be a point in time in which Jesus comes back and he will judge the nations of the earth. Absolutely. So what is something that might seem as being rampant you know, throughout the Old Testament, it's going to eventually happen anyway in the New Testament. Uh, and another point was that we were talking about how God was quite tough even on his own people. It yes. wasn't as though he had two rules, you know, right. one rule for the nation, uh, nations and, and one rule for his own that's uh, right. people. So that, he, that's he, really important. He judged his people very, uh, very severely. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus said, God is not mocked. 
a man reaps what he sows. Mm -hmm. So the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament too. Mm -hmm. So here's another thing as well. So you've answered these two things that it, there really isn't any inconsistencies in the, in the Bible, but they were purposely, they were written so that we could see different viewpoints. Uh, and obviously there's a message and a purpose in that. And the second thing is, is that it's the same God of the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. That's right. Now, another question that I have here is that there are so many different translations, so many, you know, and that kind of seems to obscure or make it even more confusing. You know, if there are different translations, is it proclaiming a different God? Yes, and some people say, you know, which Bible do you mean? <laughs> and I've often had that question put to me. But it's interesting, you know, the, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, uh, the New Testament in Greek and some parts in Aramaic. But these languages now are not in common usage in the form that they were when the, um, the Bible manuscripts were originally written. So for us to be able to understand them, we need to have scholars who have translated the Bible into languages and into phrases and terms that we understand. Mm. So there are a number of different approaches people have taken to translating the Bible. One is to do a kind of word for word, but uh, the problem with that is that it uses idioms and figures of speech from old languages which are very difficult for us to understand today. Another approach is to try and capture the meanings called dynamic equivalence and to express the same meaning in modern English, in modern words. Uh, there's always some risk, of course, that the translators uh, might change some aspect of the meaning. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there are the paraphrases, which are much freer and the writer has free expression, a bit like the Amplified Bible or the Message Version, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I would always recommend that people use a number of different translations if they're trying to understand in depth a particular part of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, no essential doctrine is compromised through any of those different translations. They're not really different? In terms of the central message, that's absolutely crystal clear. Uh -huh. That's, That's right. right. Or else the, the translators themselves would really be doing themselves a, a disservice by... Indeed. And they wouldn't be honest to the text itself. That's right. So, I mean, you could, you could get rid of a lot of these problems by just forcing people to learn Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> Isn't that right? Well, I guess, but um, there wouldn't be many who would be up to that task, I don't think, <laughs> me included. And God's given us the privilege of being able to read uh, His Word uh, in our own native tongue. Is that yes, right? that's absolutely right. Uh -huh. In His grace and mercy, He's made it available to us through the diligence and the commitment of scholars over the centuries. What about the many differences that are in the ancient texts themselves? You know, like sometimes you read, um, you know, of a particular battle or a particular uh, number of men, you know, which were counted, and you find that in two different places, the, the, the figures don't marry up. The number does not marry up the totality. Yeah, there are a number of these sorts of things, but there are always good explanations behind them. Um, the Old Testament written in Hebrew was very, very carefully guarded by the, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. They had their scribes who would meticulously make copies of it and, and the people memorized vast slabs of the, uh, of the Hebrew scriptures. So if they were to try and change anything, mm -hmm. they would have to change the memories of hundreds of thousands of people. Mm. Um, so interestingly, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947, it contained, those scrolls contained every book of the Old Testament with the exception of Esther. And when analysed, the text was exactly the same as much more recent copies, like a thousand years later, apart from a few trivial differences like spellings and occasionally a number was different, as you mentioned before. In the case of the New Testament books, though, which were mostly written in Greek, there were some, um, it was a very different set of circumstances surrounding that. You see, the apostles wrote the letters like Paul and Peter and John and so on, and the, uh, and the gospel messages were written. And then they were copied and distributed to the, the new church, the growing New Testament church. Okay. But that came under persecution and the copies were made by people who are not necessarily scholars, sometimes in great haste and, uh, and documents hastily handed around. So 
We have now many, many thousands of fragments of, uh, of the Greek New Testament, some dating back to within just a few years of when Jesus actually lived. But we don't have the originals. No, no, Is that we a don't. problem? But no, not, not at all, because if you think about it, um, uh, if you look at, uh, for instance, the writings about Julius Caesar, for instance, okay. um, or the writings of natural history by Pliny the Elder. Uh -huh. um, those, so many those documents. And, yeah. Well, those documents, in the case of Pliny the Elder, the, the uh, oldest extant copy is 750 years after he lived, oh, but wow. no one doubts their authenticity. And that those people lived and existed. Exactly. That's, uh -huh. that's right. So. The New Testament writings go much, much closer to the actual events within the lifetime, people still living uh, who w were eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' life. Uh -huh. And textual critics look at the different documents and try and work out which one was really the authentic one, which is closer to okay. the earliest. So, so how, how would they work that out, like as an example? They it like look a majority at it, or? they try and date the, uh, the documents, they look at... Um, how many manuscripts might say a particular thing. and In fact, if you look at the footnotes in your Bible, you'll see sometimes a little, a little note saying, some add this phrase, and it'll say, many manuscripts omit this, or, or whatever. Uh -huh. And uh, that's the reason those things are there. But the point is, not one of those differences has any effect on any of the doctrines of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So God, his Holy Spirit, has so superintended the process of giving us this book, the Bible, that we can have complete confidence that what it says is completely reliable. Mm -hmm. So I think these things are more, if you like, in the form of excuses. People who don't want to believe the Bible mm. point to these minor variations in the text or different eyewitness accounts and they say, ah, therefore I refuse to believe in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But that's not really a very rational position to take. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the actual Bible itself, I suppose, some of the common misconceptions that are held about the Bible. But what about science? I mean, a lot of people have this misconception. Hasn't science shown or proven that the Bible is wrong? Yes, that very often comes up. In fact, that's probably the most common thing. Richard Dawkins, for instance, is um, one who would uh, very loudly proclaim just exactly that view. And he would say, you should go where the evidence leads. Science has made it clear. The universe evolved over billions of years. The creation account in the book of Genesis is just myth and legend. Mm -hmm. But when we look at this question, we need to understand something very, very important about the nature of science. And there are two aspects to science that are very important. In this illustration here, I show what operational or experimental science is. And it's operational science which gives us all the amazing technological advances that we are so used to today, like communication, spacecraft, and air travel, mobile phones, advances in medical research, and all that sort of thing. Operational science, though, is based on observable, repeatable experiments, things that you can actually do and that someone else can do to verify that you haven't made an error mm. or an incorrect, reached an incorrect conclusion. Mm -hmm. But there's another form of science illustrated in this picture, and you could call it historical or forensic science. Now, this is a little bit like a detective story, because in this instance, the scientist is looking at evidence in the present, and he's trying to work out what happened in the past oh, okay. to lead to what he's observing in the present. So you can't repeat it. That's you right. can't repeat creation. A and exactly, <laughs> and, and it was not observed. Uh -huh. like, like the scene of a crime. You know, the forensic scientists try to reconstruct what actually happened. But there's always a number of ways that you can interpret the evidence. Uh -huh. And of course, that's the stuff of a good detective story, isn't it? You know, it turns out it was the butler what done it at yeah. the end or something <laughs> like that. So science is limited to observable, repeatable experiments. It actually only works in the present. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work in the past. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem, you see. Science can't uniquely determine the past. So how can we find out what actually happened? Now, in the case of the scene of the crime, what if there was an eyewitness? The eyewitness, assuming they're reliable, carries a great deal of weight in a court of law trying to determine the guilt or the innocence of the accused mm -hmm. because they were there and they saw it. So what we actually need with regards our origins is an eyewitness. Someone obviously who was there, uh, preferably someone who knows everything, who loves us and who wouldn't deceive us. Mm 
and who has written down everything we need to know about the past. Mm -hmm. And Rommel, we have exactly that in this book, the Bible. You see, the Bible is like a history book of the universe. It's not a science textbook, but it is a history book. Mm -hmm. And what it tells us is an eyewitness account and can be entirely relied upon. So it's like a historical narrative. Exactly. That's uh, exactly it, what it is. It's selective, I suppose. You couldn't say that it covers everything. Oh, of course not. It's not yeah. an exhaustive history, uh -huh. but it tells us all we need to know about okay. the past. Uh -huh. Now, people say, do the evolutionists have the best evidence or do the creationists have the best evidence? But the fact is we all have the same evidence. We all have the same fossils. We have the same rocks, the same stars, the same living systems but we interpret the evidence mm. very, very differently because we have different histories, mm -hmm. if you like. So the evolutionist, he believes a history that says the universe made itself and over billions and billions and billions of years, we all arrived here to be the way we are now. Mm -hmm. The Bible-believing Christian has a history laid out in the opening chapters of Genesis, which says that God created the heavens and the earth. He did so. Uh, just a few thousand years ago. He did it in six ordinary days, the Bible says. Man and woman were made perfect in an absolutely perfect creation. Mm -hmm. and then we rebelled and that brought suffering and death and decay into the world and that's why it is like it is today. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I find. I mean, when you read the Bible, you find that it gives you the, it gives you the reason of why there is death. Yes. You know, and it shows that. It shows that from the very beginning. It doesn't assume that it always existed. And what I'm getting from what you're saying as well is that from this historical science, we have one of two options. We can sort of, like in a court of law, if we were to presuppose we were all judges, I can either block out that information or I can listen to the evidence and, and, and look at it, criticise in, in an open way and yeah. see whether it's true or not true. Is that fair yeah, enough? It is. The, the court of law is a very good analogy. But, you know, it's like the, the, the Bible is on trial, um, accused of, of fraud, mm -hmm. and you have the scientific community, the evolutionists, the secularists, saying that the evidence is all against it. Attack. But there's yeah. no defence lawyer until okay. very recently, ministries like Creation Ministries International uh -huh. have been raised up to say we can interpret the evidence in the world around us in a way which is exactly consistent with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the defence lawyer and the jury are all the people, the people, our viewers, who have to judge for themselves. Uh -huh. Is the Bible the truth or not? So if you could challenge our viewers, what would you say to them? Some of these things that you're talking about now, what would you like them to go away and do? Well, I think that um, we would all gain greatly by examining the evidence for ourselves. Um, there was a group of people called the Bereans in the New Testament times, yes. and they didn't simply accept what Paul says because he said it. They went back into the Who's scriptures. Who's Paul, sorry? Paul was the, the Apostle Paul as he okay. was preaching, bringing the good news to the Gentiles. Uh -huh. Now, they didn't automatically accept it. They went and tested whether or not what he was saying was consistent with what the Bible said. So I would like to think that everyone would seriously examine the evidence, but make sure that you get a good defence lawyer as well so you hear both sides of the argument. And our website, creation.com, has got excellent material to show you how you can, in fact, look at what the Bible says, see it as actual history, and mm -hmm. discover that it's consistent with the world around us. Mm -hmm. So there really is a very strong, solid case that this is God's Word, and we can believe it right from the very first verse. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Mark, for sharing some of your insights with us. If I can just turn to the viewers now and say to them, there's the challenge. Go away. Don't just simply accept what is being said. Please go and investigate this stuff for yourself. Be objective. Look at both the pros and the cons. If you have any questions, please write in to us. And with that in mind, we just pray that the Lord will bless you and guide you. Goodbye and thank you very much.